Now, as I've said before, his work as a priest begins with his ascension into heaven and finishes with his second advent, with the revelation of Jesus Christ. In this period of time, the Bible says that again he is seated on a throne, but this time it's called the throne of grace. The throne of grace. Some Christians call this church period uh, the age of grace. The age of grace. Well, grace has always been there, but grace for salvation by grace through faith alone without any works is uh, unique to this period of time, the church age. And in this church age, he sits on the throne of grace and his work is that of a priest in this church age. <clears throat> Look at Hebrews chapter 6, we will read verses 19 and 20. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus Christ is our high priest. That's his work in heaven. He's our high priest. And he is an high priest, not after the order of Levi or Aaron, but he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who is not from uh, uh, the descendants of Aaron. He is not from the descendants of the Levites. And just like him, Jesus Christ, who is not a descendant of Aaron or Levi, he is a descendant of Judah. And yet he is a high priest. And look at what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So his work as a priest is up there in heaven. When he was on the earth, he was not a priest. He was not mediating between God and man. Uh, or in other words, he was not making intercession to God for man. What was he doing? He was preaching the word of God. He was revealing the will of God to mankind. That's his work as a prophet. But in the present time, we are the prophets of God who preach and teach the book of prophecy. But his work is that of a high priest and he's up there in heaven. And his work as a high priest, again, can be divided into two parts. The first one is that of a mediator. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. As mediator, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ mainly is to mediate between God and men for salvation. This, is, this work uh, of the high priest as a mediator is to do with the salvation of sinners. Look at Hebrews chapter 7 verses 24 to 27. Hebrews 7, 24 to 27. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto uh, uh, God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, and undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up a sacrifice, or offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. In both 1 Timothy 2 and Hebrews chapter 7, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as a mediator is said to be connected to salvation. Salvation of lost sinners. And that's what he's doing, pleading for those lost sinners before God. 
he makes intercession for them and if anyone comes to him to God by him he is able to save them to the uttermost now that's the main thing that you need to understand it's not like Jesus Christ is begging God to save those sinners that's not what it means it means that when a sinner comes to God he's not acceptable you see that God cannot accept a sinner because the Bible says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before God no matter how good you are you cannot be accepted by God because your holiness your goodness your righteousness can never match that of God's that's why you're not accepted but when you come to God through Jesus Christ you are immediately accepted because he makes intercession for you he's your mediator that's why it's important to see this damnable doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that there are other uh, mediators between God and men uh, other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a damnable heresy. No Pope can be a mediator between God and men. Mary cannot be the mediator between God and men. It is the man Christ Jesus who is seated on the right hand of God on the throne of grace and interceding for that lost sinner who comes to God through him. So when a sinner comes to God through Jesus, Jesus Christ intercedes for him with God. And God saves that sinner and gives him eternal life. So he is a mediator between God and men. And that's the first thing he does as our priest, as our high priest. But there's a second thing that he does as our high priest. Look at 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours only, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He, sitting on the throne of God, does these two things. Firstly, he's the mediator. And then secondly, he is our advocate. As I've said before, the mediator is to do with sinners, unsaved people, his work as a mediator. But his work as an advocate has to do with believers, with born-again Christians. Because 1 John chapter 2 is talking to born-again Christians, my little children. And it has to do also with our sanctification, as I've said, remember that his main work as the high priest is sanctification. When we sin, he is our advocate with the Father. You see, brethren, this is very clear in the Bible. Because Jesus Christ is our advocate with the Father, we do not lose our salvation. We cannot lose our salvation. We are the sons of God. We are not servants anymore, we are the sons of God. And even when a son does something wrong, he does not cease to be a son. That's how it is with, uh, in our relationship with God. We are the sons of God by trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior. We can never lose this sonship. And when we sin, Jesus Christ is our advocate with the Father. He advocates for you and for me. And it is because of his blood that was shed on the cross for our sins that we are forgiven when we repent and turn to him and we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and sanctified. Now there is this heresy among Christians. They say some Bible teachers teach that since Jesus died for all our sins upon the cross, there is no need for us now when we sin to confess our sins to God and repent and turn from them. They say we are already forgiven. No need to ask for forgiveness again. That's a heresy. Yes, Jesus died for our sin. That is the sin principle in us. The sin nature inside of us. He died for our sins. For every sin that we have ever committed and will ever commit. No doubt. But you see, the sins that we commit in the present time break our fellowship with God. They do not break our relationship with God. We are his sons. But it would break our fellowship with God. But Jesus Christ as our advocate 
helps us to be restored in that fellowship with God. And you must be very careful about these false teachings that you don't have to confess your sins. The Bible is very clear. If we say we have no sin, we are liars in 1 John 1. And in the same chapter, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's important when we commit sins to confess them to God so that we may be sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ, our advocate. Look at Romans chapter 8 verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yet rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. As our great high priest, he is making intercession for us because he is our advocate. He is not the advocate of the unsaved person. He is the advocate of the born again Christian. But as far as the unsaved person is concerned, as a high priest, as a high priest, he is a mediator between God and men. But when it comes to us, born again believers, he is our advocate with the, uh, the Father. He was a prophet and he is a priest. And the Bible also tells us that we born again Christians are also the priests of God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Once again, you must remember this, that the so-called clergy in a church who are called priests are not uh, someone holding a special position between God and men. Absolutely not. The priesthood of all believers is a doctrine that is found in the Bible very clearly and it's a doctrine which was preached by the great reformers who preached against the damnable heresies of the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic Church says that the priests and the clergy are higher than the common people, laity. That's why remember Jesus said, Thou hatest the works of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. Nicolaitans Nikau, to conquer, uh, laity, laos means people, conquering the people, the common people. It is the priest who said, we are greater than you, you must submit to our authority. No, the Christian should submit to the authority of the scriptures. Yes, there is a sense in which church members would uh, submit to the authority of their leader, the pastor. But that's not as a priest, as common people submitting to a priest. No, all of us are priests of God. We don't need any priest, to, uh, a human priest to mediate for us. We have direct access to God. Every born again Christian is a priest and is called upon to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. You are a priest of God if you are a born again Christian, just like Jesus Christ who is our great high priest. So you have Jesus Christ, a prophet in the past, a priest in the present time. But this is what the Bible says about the third distinct period of time of his work. Uh, this is from Revelation to eternity, as I've said, from Revelation to eternity. This is the final period of time of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this time, as I've said, he sits on the throne of David. And this throne of David is called the throne of his glory. The throne of his glory. These are the three distinct thrones on which Jesus Christ sits in these three periods of time. As a prophet, remember his throne is the throne of God up there in heaven. In this church period, in his work as a great high priest, his throne is the throne of grace. Remember, the writer to the Hebrews says that we can come to the throne of grace knowing that we have a high priest who is not... Uh, uh, you know, who is not untouched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was uh, 
tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. That's why we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. So he sits on the throne of grace, helping born again believers, being their advocate with the Father. And as a king, he comes back to the earth to sit on the throne of David. And the throne of David is a literal throne in Jerusalem. Again, a lot of Bible teachers who do not teach the Bible from a dispensational point of view, confound all these three different uh, uh, parts of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they tell you that after his ascension, Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne of his glory in heaven and he's ruling the world. Amillennialists, post-millennialists, this is what they teach. And again, that is a, a very wrong interpretation of scripture. It is nothing but spiritualizing the scriptures. But if you rightly divide the word of truth, you would see that the throne on which he is seated today is indeed in heaven, but he is not ruling the world as king of kings and lord of lords. The Bible says that the devil is the god of this world today. Yes, that doesn't mean that God has absolutely no control over the world. It doesn't mean that God has absolutely no say in the affairs of this world. It doesn't mean that. Everything belongs to God, no doubt. But in this present age that we are living in, dispensation we are living in, the devil is the God of this world. Again, many Christians think when Jesus died on the cross and rose up again, he bruised the serpent's head. No, he did not do that. In Romans 16, Paul makes it very clear that God will shortly in the future bruise the serpent's head under their feet. The, uh, Jesus Christ did not do that. If he had bruised the devil's head on the cross, the devil would not be active today at all. But he is very active. He goes like a roaring lion, seeing whom he may devour. But you see, when he comes here, at, at the second coming, at the end of the millennium, when Jesus Christ cast the devil into the lake of fire, that's when the devil's head is bruised permanently. But Christians don't see this. They confound everything. They, they spiritualize everything. And they say, Jesus Christ today is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he is ruling the universe today from the throne of God in heaven. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. They say, oh, you are the son of a king. Live like a king. You are the son of a king. You should not be poor in this world. And all that kind of nonsense comes out of this teaching. Prosperity gospel. You're the child of a king. Yes, but you see, in this dispensation, he has called us to suffer for his sake so that we may reign and rule with him in the future. The Bible is very clear about that. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Without suffering in this present age, there is no reigning with Christ. Unless we are not faithful to him today, unless we are faithful to him uh, to him today, we cannot rule with him in the future. So, this final part of the glorification or, or uh, the final period of time of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ can be divided again into two parts. Firstly, the millennial kingdom of Christ. Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation. At the end of the seven year tribulation, he comes back to the earth and establishes a thousand year millennial reign. A thousand year reign sitting on the throne of David. It's a Davidic kingdom. The promises given to David would be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ in that 1000 years. The millennium is not going on today. It's going to be established. The, the kingdom will be established at the second coming of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Look at Luke chapter 1 verse 32. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So this is David's throne. David's throne. 
that Jesus Christ is going to sit upon and fulfill all the promises given to David. So that's the first part. For a thousand years, Jesus Christ is going to establish a, a, a military dictatorship on the earth. And every person who disobeys him in this time would be cast into hell. Salvation is by works in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it was faith and works. In the church age, it is faith and nothing else. But in the tribulation, it will be once again faith and works. And then finally, when Jesus Christ is on the earth, it would be by works, just like Adam and Eve. They saw Jesus Christ talking to him every day. There is no need of faith. All they had to do was obey. God said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they disobeyed it, that commandment. And the result was sin and death, both spiritual death and physical death. But if Adam and Eve had obeyed God, then they would have been made righteous before him. And then they would have been given access to the tree of life. And they could have lived physically forever and ever as saved people, as righteous people. But we know that they disobeyed God and uh, the result was sin and death. But once again in the millennial reign, Jesus Christ would be upon the earth and people would be able to see him. And all they have to do is obey what he commands them. And when they disobey, like Adam and Eve, they are, uh, Adam and Eve were not cast into hell, but the people in the millennial reign would be cast into hell. And that's how the rule of Jesus Christ would be in the millennium. But the Bible says, in spite of the fact that Jesus Christ sits on the throne of David in all his glory and rules for a thousand years with a strong hand and breaks the nations into pieces with a rod as a, uh, you know, and the nations are broken as a potter's vessel and all that. People still rebel against him at the end of the millennium. Remember, in Revelation 20, the Bible says that Satan is bound for a thousand years at the second coming of Jesus Christ. But at the end of the thousand years, he's released once again and he goes to the nations of the world and raises a great army to fight against Jesus Christ and Israel. Of course, fire from God comes and consumes those armies and Satan is cast into the lake of fire where he'll burn forever and ever. That's how the millennium ends. And the Bible says that at the end of the millennium, God destroys this present earth with fire. The Bible is very clear about that. That this present earth is destroyed with a fire and God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And of course, there will be a new Jerusalem in which the church of Jesus Christ would be new Jerusalem. That's our eternal home and that's called our mother in the Bible, in the book of Galatians. In this new earth, this is the second phase of the kingdom. This is the second phase of the work of Jesus Christ as a king. In the first phase, he rules a thousand years on the earth. But his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Look at Luke chapter 1 verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. There is an end to the millennial kingdom. The earth is destroyed by fire. You'll read about this in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 8 to 10. That this present earth is destroyed by fire. That's the end of the millennial reign. That's the end of the earth. But that's not the end of the reign of Jesus Christ. He rules for a thousand years on this present earth. But he rules forever in the new earth. Forever and ever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. He is a king forever in the future. And again, I want to say this to you. Right now, he's not ruling as king. Let me show you a couple of verses for you to understand this very clearly. Look at Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11 and 
We'll read verse 15, Revelation 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That means, till the second coming, the kingdoms of this world are not the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That means he is not ruling right now. He comes back and takes the kingdoms of this world. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, where we find the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 4 and verse 5. And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The kingdoms of the world. Verse 6. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give unto thee, will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. This is what the Bible says. When the devil said this to Jesus Christ, Jesus didn't say, what nonsense are you talking devil? The kingdoms of this world belong to me. I am the king and I am ruling forever. He didn't say that. He didn't deny what the devil said. He said, he showed him the kingdoms of this world and he said, these are delivered unto me and I give them to whomsoever I will. He is the God of this world. But in Revelation 11 verse 15 we have seen, at the second coming, when the seventh angel sounds, Jesus Christ comes back to the earth and then the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever not just in the millennial kingdom but forever and ever in eternity future yes we are also kings because of Jesus Christ just as we are prophets just as we are priests we are also kings look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen we are kings and we are priests and we are prophets. But you see, today in this uh, dispensation that we are living in, we can use our offices of prophet and priest. But we cannot literally rule in this age that we are living in. It's impossible. To remember what Jesus said to, this, to his disciples, In this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He didn't say, be of good cheer, I will make sure you don't go through tribulation. I'm not talking about the tribulation period, I'm talking about sufferings. In this world, we will have sufferings, trials, testings. And we need to uh, take up our cross, deny ourselves and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But once he comes back, we literally rule with him as kings and we will rule with him forever and ever but as i've said there are conditions to that we can lose that inheritance we will never uh, lose our sonship we will never be disinherited by god in the sense that he says we are not his heirs or sons anymore that can never happen but we can lose our right to rule and reign with the lord jesus christ not only in this thousand years, but throughout eternity. If you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him, Paul says. And if we live a holy life and have a close walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and are faithful to him in serving him today, in spite of all the obstacles, in spite of all the sufferings that we endure, we will be given this great privilege to rule as kings with the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the greater life and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the past, in the present and in the future. In the past he is a prophet and as a prophet his work can be seen in creation, in revelation to the Old Testament saints as the angel of the Lord and then in his incarnation uh, when he made atonement for the sins of all mankind. So from creation to his ascension he is a prophet. 
from his ascension to the second coming he is a priest and right now he is up there in heaven interceding for believers as their advocate and mediating between sinners and God when they come to God by Jesus Christ and in the future from his second coming to eternity forever and ever Jesus Christ will be the king he's going to be here on the earth and then in this new earth ruling as king of kings and lord of lords this is the dispensational work of the lord jesus christ god bless you